So we are going to continue the discussion on fault tolerance today and uh, we'll overflow into the next class. So here are the set of topics we are going to look at. Uh, so I motivated the need for looking at fault tolerance. Uh, we are going to just use that and then start looking at techniques. Incidentally, there is a interesting talk that uh, from a faculty job candidate today at four o'clock. It's across the hall, which is going to be on uh, browser operating systems. How a browser has become a complex distributed application, and how you should implement security fault tolerance. Some of what we have studied here, or uh, from a research perspective, is going to be discussed there. If you have time, please go to that talk. It may be useful to understand from a research perspective how some of these ideas play. Okay. So having said that, we will continue our discussion on fault tolerance today. Okay. Security is coming down the pipe. Uh, we will talk about this problem of agreement in the presence of faults. I will uh, describe this problem of Byzantine's fault and the Byzantine's general problem in that context. I'll say a little bit about distributed, uh, distributed or the reliable communication. We looked at a little bit of this when we were doing RPCs to see how uh, failures of uh, servers or clients should be handled. We'll look at that again. And then we will spend uh, whatever time remains on this problem of distributed commit. I'll talk about failure recovery, but most likely that overflow uh, into the next class. Okay. Uh, in the context of distributed commit, I would add us another sub bullet on Paxos, which is really uh, the implementation of some of these ideas in today's systems. Yeah, so just to remind you, last time I was talking about using redundancy or replication to get fault tolerance. I showed you this circuit. Okay, and the top part is uh, three components in the circuit A, B, C with no redundancy, so if any component fails in that electronic circuit, then the circuit doesn't work, it produces bad results. Okay. What is shown here is, uh, the lower uh, figure is a replicated version of the circuit where every component is replicated, okay, it sees an input, it produces an output, there is a voter that takes the output from the previous stage, takes the majority output and sends it on. So the assumption is you can handle up to one fault. So at least up to, at most one of these circuits, uh, at most one of these components in any stage can disagree and the voter is simply going to take majority and pass it on. Okay, the voter is also replicated because you don't want any single point of failure. Okay, this is called TMR or triple modular redundancy. It's a concept we are going to use in the context of software systems. Okay, we'll have replicated components, we'll have voting to figure out what's going on and so on. Okay. Any questions on this before I actually describe uh, actual software principles that implement the same idea? Okay. So, basically we are going to now start talking about this problem of agreement, okay, and which is simply how should the processes agree on the result of a computation. Let's say a process is performing some computation, okay. Uh, there may be more multiple replicas, some replicas may have some sort of a fault, yet you want uh, to figure out what the right output is in, for any input. The computation could be something like a database query or it could just be any arbitrary computation. Okay, and you are going to assume there are n replicas and you want or k replicas and you want to figure out n rather than what, what's the right output. Okay, we want our system to be k fault tolerant which means that it should be able to uh, survive k simultaneous faults. Okay? If you set k to 1, that basically says there can be at most one fault and the system will continue to function. If you have a two fault tolerant system, that can handle two concurrent faults. Up to two arbitrary processes can fail and yet the system continues. So you can pick any value of k. Okay? In most cases, we will say k equals 1, but that doesn't have to be the case. It depends on what kind of resiliency you want to build in your system. Okay, so we want a k fault tolerant system. So the system can survive k faults and it can function. Okay, now uh, how much replication or redundancy you need in the system is actually going to depend on what kinds of faults these are. Okay, so the simplest kind of fault is what is called crash faults. Okay where processes will just fail silently. Okay? 
In other words, the failure you are trying to handle is one of a crash, okay? meaning that the, either the system is working or some processes have crashed. Okay? So this is actually a very simple kind of fault because uh, in this case, if any component produces an output, we will assume that the output is right okay? because either it produces an output or it has crashed in which case it produces no output. But when it produces an output, we assume that the output is right. So this is called crash fault tolerance and in this case if you need to tolerate k faults you need k plus 1 components meaning if up to k processes fail if you have k plus 1 replicas there will be at least one replica that's up okay, because up to k have failed at any given time so one that's up is going to produce the right result for you and the system can su support or, or survive k faults okay. so that's crash fault or that's a much simpler kind of fault that you can tolerate okay more complex techniques uh, or a more complex kind of fault are what are called Byzantine faults. Okay? Here anything can happen okay? which means your process can fail and not produce any output. It can produce, it can be up, it can produce the right output, it can be up, it can produce garbage okay, as its output and it can be up, it can produce malicious output to confuse what is going on in the system. Okay? So these are the most general kinds of faults you will see. Okay, so the processes can continue to run even if they are sick. Okay, there could be a hack and the hacker is taken over the system and is letting the system produce output. The output could be malicious, output may be right, output could be bad, it could be garbage. Anything can happen in this. Okay. So this is a more general kind. So it's much harder to deal with Byzantine faults and crash fault tolerance. Even the crash fault tolerance, the only kind of bug we were trying to deal with was a crash. Crash means it doesn't do anything. The process just crashes and it basically stops producing output at all. But when it's up, we assume that there are no bugs that's performing that. In this case, when it's up, there could be a bug, there could be a malicious uh, attacker who's taken over the process or it could just, process could be just doing arbitrary, non-deterministic thing, anything could happen. And yet we want to be able to tolerate this kind of faults. Okay? So as we will see, uh, to handle k simultaneous faults, you would need a much higher degree of replication to deal with Byzantine faults. Okay? In crash fault tolerance, if there are k simultaneous faults, you need k plus 1 replicas. Put another way, if k was 1, if you wanted to have crash fault tolerance, you need two processes okay, to handle one fault. Because if one fails, the other one continues to run. Okay, in case of Byzantine fault tolerance, that's no longer the case. If you only have two replication and one of them starts producing some arbitrary output, the two processes or two replicas will start disagreeing on what the output is. If you ask them, run this query, provide an output, they'll produce the two different results. You don't know which one is correct. Okay? So you need to handle a much higher degree of replication. Here we'll see what the degree of replication should be, which is why there's a question mark. I haven't said how to deal with this. But is that clear? Much of our discussion is going to focus on Byzantine faults because they are more complex to deal with, harder to handle. Any question on this? Okay. So let's now talk, start looking at how to handle Byzantine faults. So we look at several different scenarios. Okay. First, we'll assume that the processes are not faulty, okay, but the network is faulty. Okay. Meaning that, let's say there are two processes that are communicating with one another. Okay. So two, pro two perfect processes that communicate with one another over an unreliable channel. Okay, meaning that the network is unreliable. Okay? But you can have different kinds of unreliable networks. If, if you want to do something that's equivalent to crash fault tolerance, then the network is unreliable in that it can either deliver a packet or lose your packet. But if a packet arrives, you assume that it is what was sent. Okay? But if you have a Byzantine channel, okay, then your the network can actually flip some bits in your packet and you send something, some other output arrives at the other. So if you have an unreliable channel, anything can happen. You send some packet, the packet may not reach, packet may reach with the, without being altered or it could be altered in transit. Okay. Now we'll assume that, just for simplicity, we'll assume that the message we are sending is a one bit message. Okay, your packet is one bit. Okay, so you are, well, there are only two values you can send, a zero or a one, okay, if you have one bit message. Okay, so all we are trying to do is we are sending a one bit message can either send a 0 or a 1, at the other end something arrives and you want to make sure that whatever you have sent has actually reached the other end successfully. 
Okay, so how do you actually ensure that if you send a packet on an unreliable channel, that you are going to actually receive it successfully? Okay, that's really the question we want to answer. And that is going to help us see if we can actually deal with an unreliable network between two perfect processes. Okay, after we talk about this, we'll see what happens if the processes themselves have a fault. Right now, we are saying processes don't have a fault, the network can be faulty. Okay, this is analogous to the two army problem. Okay, so that's a direct analogy between this and a real world scenario where let's say there are two armies waiting to attack okay, a common enemy. And we want the two armies to coordinate with one another on what time they want to launch that time. Okay. And the way they are going to do this is they are going to actually send a messenger. Okay. Or one general is going to send a messenger saying, let us attack at a certain time to the other army general. Okay. And we will assume that the messenger has to traverse through hostile territory. Okay. So, the messenger may not reach at all, the messenger gets captured or the messenger may get captured and a fake, uh, some uh, intruder can be actually sent masquerading as the messenger with a fake message just to confuse the two armies. Okay? So this is equivalent of a Byzantine general problem where you are trying to agree on what time to launch an attack okay? and you are going to do this by sending a message. You do not know what happens to the message in transit because the messenger goes through hostile territory. The question is how can the two armies agree on the time to launch an attack? Okay. That's the same problem as you send a one bit message and you both processes agree that the message was actually uh, received and was received successfully meaning without being altered. Is that clear? The problem is clear? Okay, so now think about what can you do to uh, solve this problem. Okay, let's say the first the army one sends a messenger off to army two. Okay, how does army one know that the messenger is actually reached? What could you do? Yeah, you will have to ask for a technology. This is not rocket science. You are actually thinking two real people trying to send messages back and forth. If you send a message to someone and you want to know the message reached, what will you ask? You will ask the person to send you a reply saying the message reached. That's the only way you will know that the message is reached. Okay. So you are going to ask. So let's say you are going to say, I sent off a messenger. Messenger reached the other end. So if you read successfully, have the other general sign saying, I received a message and bring it back. So now let's assume that the initial message reads successfully okay, and uh, you send the messenger back. Okay. Messenger actually reaches the uh, army one again with the message saying I have delivered the message and I have a signature saying the message was received and now here uh, you know now that the message was received because I have come back and told you that I delivered the message. Okay. Is that enough? for the two armies to say now we have figured out the time to launch the attack. So we need to the general that um, that received the message and ensure that the general that originally sent the message got the reply. So. Okay. So as is being pointed out, uh, the first army general now knows that the message was sent or, or received by the other end and you got an acknowledgement. Okay, so now I, you know you know that, or you meaning the first general knows that you told the other army general saying let's launch the attack at my name and they received that message and you know that the message was received because you got an act. But how is the second general to know that the acknowledgement reached? Because what if the messenger on the return journey was captured. Okay, so the second general doesn't know whether the first general has actually received the message. So the second general won't know that the first general knows he received the he or she received the message. Okay, do you see the problem? 
So don't see the problem, you will not understand anything about business intelligence. So ask for me to say again what the problem is. Okay. So essentially what has happened is, or, or think about it, uh, rather than two genders, you and your friend are trying to decide what time to go to a party okay, over an unreliable channel. Okay, you say, tell them, let's go at five. Okay. Friend says, yes, that message comes back. But the friend doesn't know you got the yes, so they don't know that you now know that uh, the, she knows or he knows five o'clock is their point. Right now. So what would you do? Okay, how would you actually figure this out? How is the second general going to figure this out or your friend going to figure this out? Not a lot you can do. Okay, you sent a message, you got an acknowledgement, but uh, you don't know whether the acknowledgement reached or not. What would you do to figure out that acknowledgement reached? So this is no different than asking how do you know that the message reached. So the only way you will know the acknowledgement is now a packet that you are sending back. It's a return message you are sending back. How would you know return message sent back? You send an act for the act. Okay, so you will say, okay, I got your message. I saw that you sent back me a return message. Here is an act saying I received your return message. Okay, now suppose that the act to the act reaches successfully at the other end. Have the two armies reached agreement at this point? Agreement saying that I know that you know and you know that I know what to do. The answer is either we have reached agreement or not reached agreement. So what do you think is the Yes. Yes. So I mean, you will not know whether the act to the act has actually been received because the channel is unreliable. Okay? No message, whether it's an act or an act to the act, that goes over the wire will is guaranteed to be delivered successfully. So if you are depending on that delivery of that message to say that we have agreed on what to do, then you have you cannot because you don't know whether the act to the act. So you can say, I'll keep do recursing. I'll keep sending an act to every act that goes back and forth, but I will never reach agreement because you never know whether the last message that was sent has actually been received at all. Okay. So, so I think the basic problem here is that two perfect processes can actually never reach agreement over an unreliable channel because no matter whether you send the original message or you send acknowledgement, you send acknowledgement to the acknowledgement or keep sending acts back and forth, you never know whether the final message has been delivered. If you do not know, you will actually not be able to guarantee to yourself that we have agreed on what time to launch the attack. Okay, so if you have two armies uh, that want to agree on a time and they are sending messages over an unreliable hostile territory or two processes that are trying to send a one bit message. Okay? It's a fundamental property okay? that you can actually never solve this problem. This problem is impossible to solve. Okay, so, so this problem we cannot solve. If your network is going to do bad things to you, you cannot actually decide on what to do. So that problem is impossible, but now let's change this around and say, let's not worry about the network. Let's assume that the network is not Byzantine faulty. Okay? Network is not going to change your messages or something. It can drop messages, but if you drop messages, you time out and you keep resending and ultimately your message will get there. That's what we assume in the context of the internet. The network can drop messages, but if it alters messages, you can either do checksums and figure it out. Okay, so we'll assume now that the network is essentially going to be reliable. Okay, and reliability can be built on top of an unreliable network using TCP. Let's assume you use TCP to communicate. 
TCP will ensure that the messages will eventually get through and they will get through fine. Right? So we will assume that the network is fine, but now the processes can be faulty. Okay, the application processes that are talking to one another can be faulty. Okay, in particular, this is called the Byzantine general problem, okay, generalization of the previous approach, where there are n armies or n generals, each having a division of an army that want to coordinate with one another to launch an attack. Okay? And we'll assume that some subset of these generals are traitors. Okay? They are faulty processes or they are traitors, which means they can do arbitrary things. Okay? You are trying to reach agreement in a group, what time to launch the attack, the traitors can, are allowed to do anything they want. They can inject fake messages to confuse what the matters are, or they can uh, alter messages, they can drop messages, they can do whatever they want. Yet we want the rest of the generals who are not faulty or not traitors to be able to reach agreement. Okay? This is the same problem as Byzantine faulty processes that I talked about previously. You send an input or you send a query to n processes okay, and replicas. Some of them are Byzantine faulty. Some replicas will produce garbage or produce bad results just to confuse matters. Yet you want to figure out what the right answer is. Same is true here. Generals want to figure out what time to launch the attack. That's really the question you are asking in this case. Okay, the question, so we are going to assume M, M generals out of N are traitors. So the question is how large should N be okay, to solve tolerate K traitors or K faults? Okay. If you can solve this problem, then you can implement the same idea in a software system with replicated applications to address the problem. Yes, question that was asked. Yeah, so in this case, uh, traitors may not reply, but the network is fine. The network is not faulty. So if the traitor doesn't reply, you will basically assume the same as a garbage reply. Yes, what's the question? I mean, they shouldn't be able to drop other No, no, I think well, I didn't mean that you can drop messages. So there's a network and there are processes. Traitors may not reply to you at all, is all you're saying. It's not that if you send a message, they cause somebody else's message to be dropped. Okay, because one type of a Byzantine fault is a crash, where the, you receive messages, but the general doesn't send any message back, any acknowledgement back or anything like that. So you may get nothing from a general, you may get a message back, but you don't know whether to trust that message or what that message is. That's all you're saying. But if a message is sent, it will be received as it was sent. That's what we are assuming. Okay, any questions here on what the problem is? I haven't said how to solve the problem, but that's the Byzantine general problem. So here is an example of how we are going to solve this problem uh, using a recursive algorithm by Lamport. Here we are going to assume there are four generals. Okay? There are the nodes labeled 1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay? And we'll assume that there are three loyal generals and one traitor. Okay? In this case, k equals 1. Okay? We know that there's at most one traitor. Okay, here I have actually shown that three is the faulty process. It's the traitor, but in general you don't know that. Okay, the, the processes themselves have to agree on who is the traitor and figure out what the right answer is. Okay, but we know just to sort of work through the exam. Okay, and now here the what they are trying to figure out is they are going to they are just communicating how many soldiers each of them has. Okay, so they can figure out. What's the total size of the army? It doesn't matter what you want to agree on. Okay, you can agree on the time to attack, the whatever. What you are trying to agree on is not important. Some question you want to answer, some computation you want to perform. Here, what we are trying to agree on is you want to agree on your troop strength. Each general announces their troop strength, so you want to see what is the total size of the army that they collectively have to launch the attack. Okay, that's what they are trying to do in this example. So this algorithm is recursive uh, proposed by Lamport. It works in multiple rounds. Okay? And the idea is very simple. In each round, you are going to announce, in the first round, you are going to announce how many soldiers you have to everyone else. You are going to broadcast this message. Okay? Just for simplicity, we will have assume that general one or, or one has one soldier, two has two soldiers, three has three soldiers and four has four soldiers. What the number of soldiers is not important making up an example here. Okay? So one is going to send one to all the other processes. So that's the message you see. Okay? Two is going to send two to all the other processes. Three is going to send, can do whatever it wants. It can actually send the right message. It can send different messages to different processes. 
just to confuse matters. Okay, or it can send send the same wrong message to other processes as well. Okay? It's allowed to do whatever it wants. So we use, we are just assuming that it's going to send x to one, y to two, and z to four. But x, y, and z could take any values. They could take the same value. They could take the same right value. They could take the same wrong value. Okay, and we that's so why we we'll just assume it just sends some x, y, and z. And then 4 is going to send 4 to all of the process. That's the end of round 1. Okay. So far, so good. Any questions? Yes. Okay. So at the end of round 1, you receive, each general has received a message from all other generals that simply says, I have so many soldiers. Okay. But you don't know who the traitor is at this point. You just received some messages. Okay. Now you want to repeat this to try to identify who is the bad general in the mix. Okay? The way we are going to do this is we are going to recurse and say everyone is then going to tell everyone else what they received from the other genders. Okay? So you are basically going to take whatever you received at the end of round one, take all of those messages and rebroadcast those messages to everyone else. Okay? So one is going to basically say I got this value from two, this value from three and this value from four is going to make a message and send it out which is saying I got 1, 2, x, 4. Okay? It also sends its own values. Okay? And 2 is going to say I got 1, 2, y, 4. 3 is going to send, send arbitrary things. In this case, just for fun, it sends the right values out. Okay? Just to confuse matters. But it could have sent anything it wants. Okay? And 4 is going to send 1, 2, z, and 4. Okay? That's what's going to happen at the end of round 2. Okay? Now, you'll see that. So at the end of round 2, this is what everyone else has got except 3. 1 gets 1, 2, y, 4, it may get a, b, c, d from the trainer and it goes 1, 2, z, 4. Okay? And 2 is going to get a similar value and 4 is going to get a similar value. Okay? And as you will see now, you can actually figure out who is lying to you. Okay? Based on whatever you got because you will see that there is one column here that seems to not match. And whatever is coming from that process also doesn't match the other two. But whatever the other two processes are saying to 2 and 4 say, they seem to match because 2 says I got 1, 2, 4, 1, 2, 4 and this is the one that's actually not matching. So you can figure out based on this that 3 is actually sending bad replies to everyone because whatever others are getting from 3 doesn't seem to match up and it is itself sending garbage to you. Okay. Now, if 3 were to decide that it's for some reason it's going to send you the right value, then all of them will match and that's okay. It just because a traitor sends you the right answer doesn't actually confuse matters. Because your job is not to necessarily find traitor, but it's to actually find the right answer. Okay, so you can find the right answer here. If all of them agree, then there's nothing, there's no mismatch. But if at least one side starts sending bad values, at the end of two rounds, you can figure out based on what everyone told each other and what everyone is telling you they receive from others. Is that clear? Okay, so the simple example is taken directly from the book. Okay. Now what this is also telling you is the following. Okay. To handle a single fault, single Byzantine faults, you actually need a replication factor of 4. Now, what was it for crash fault tolerance? The processors could just simply fail silently but not produce bad output ever. You wanted to tolerate a single fault. How many replicas do you need? You need two replicas. In this case, to tolerate a single fault, you need four replicas. Actually, what you will see is to tolerate K faults, you are going to need 3k plus 1 replicas. Okay, in this case, k equals 1, so we got 4. Okay, if you had 2 faults, then 3k plus 1 would get 7 replicas to handle 2 concurrent faults. Okay? So you will see Byzantine fault tolerance imposes a high degree of redundancy on your system because these processes can do arbitrarily bad things. You need to have a much higher degree of replication and essentially this is voting. Okay, this algorithm has essentially voted where you tell whatever you want everyone and they tell you and essentially you voted what the right answer is and you figured out if somebody was disagreeing with you. Okay? 
So you need a much higher degree of replication. Okay, so think about this from your uh, deployment cost. Okay, if you wanted to handle Byzantine fault, you want to let's say start up a single application, web application, it says you have to actually buy four servers, run four copies of the application. Every request goes to all four servers. You take the output, you vote saying what's the right output to send back to the client and then based on the results of the vote, you send back the client. Okay, so your hardware costs have quadrupled, software costs have quadrupled and not just doubled. In crash fault tolerance, you doubled okay, for to handle one fault. Here you are going to have to pay four times as much to deploy an application. It's a much higher expense to bear. Okay, but if, if you want to tolerate Byzantine fault, that's the kind of cost you are going to have to Okay, So the takeaway that you have to uh, go with is Byzantine faults are much harder to deal with. Okay, First of all, the protocol to figure out who is actually acting Byzantine faulty is, is not a trivial one. It requires voting and multiple rounds of voting and so on. But more importantly, it requires a much higher degree of redundancy in your system to deal with this problem. Okay, so most real systems or many real systems just say we will stop at crash faults. Okay? We'll have enough redundancy so that if some machine goes down and stops responding, there are others that can take over. They do not typically go and say we will handle Byzantine faults where anything goes but I'm still able to function. Okay, with up to K concurrent faults. Is that clear? Okay, so I'm going to show an example of the, the same problem with not three, but uh, not four, but three generals. Okay, uh, so we will still want to tolerate one fault, which is uh, three is faulty here, but there are only three processes, three replicas in the system, not four. We want to see if we can actually address the same problem as before, find out that three is actually faulty. Okay. So we are going to repeat Lamport's algorithm. So each general is going to send its proof strengths to everyone else. Okay. So 1 is going to send 1, 2 and 3, 2 is going to send 2 and 3 is going to send arbitrarily. So it's going to send x to 1 and y to 2. Okay. So at the uh, end of round 1, so you have gotten 1, 2 and x. 1 has received that, 2 has gotten 1, 2, y, 3 has gotten all of the values. It's the trade-up. Okay. Now, you are going to rebroadcast this to everyone and at the end of round 2, you are essentially going to get 1, 2, y, well, that's what 1 gets from 2 and it gets a, b, c from 2. 2 gets 1, 2 and x and d, e, f from 3. Okay. Now what is clear is that for each, for to each process, what's clear is that the other two processes are not agreed. But you can't figure out which one is faulty, which one is the traitor rather. Not that you know that there is someone is faulty, but you can't figure out which one is the traitor. Okay, because you just see that there's disagreement between the other two, but you don't know which one is telling the truth, which one is lying. Okay, this happens because you don't have four replicas, you have only three replicas. Okay. The analogy to think about is let's say you and uh, two other friends want to decide on something okay okay and one of your friend lies but you don't know which one so if you ask them something they give you two different answers but you don't know who is telling the truth and who is lying and if you want to figure out who is lying you actually need three because there's one liar the other two will agree so you know who is lying to you in your question yeah, but, uh, that's the, the one already know What's your question? At C? Yeah, at C for 1. It already knows 1 to x from the previous step. It already knows 1, 2, and x from the previous step. Yes. Yeah, why not it put in the best? You are saying why not take your own answer and put it in the yeah, best? Yeah, you have 1 to x, 1 to 1, and ABC. Yeah, so I think the point is there's a difference between trying to find faults. It's a good question. The point difference between trying to find faults and difference between reaching agreement. Okay? So if you go back to the problem of uh, uh, you want to basically announce your troop strengths. Okay? So you basically announce your two troop strengths and you want others to tell you their troop strength. When you start off you don't know what the troop strengths of others are. If those two are disagreeing you know your value but if those two other generals are disagreeing you don't know who is telling the truth, who is lying. 
So I think that's the problem. So when you try to find agreement, you, in this case, you're not taking your own value as you're looking at everyone else because there's other inputs coming to you. Okay. If you could add your own value, yes, I think that would be the same thing. You would have actually three values and two of them will agree, one would not agree. But the confrontation involves input from others. You didn't start off by knowing. So what this is simply saying is because we did, uh, did not have 4, which was 3m plus 1, we couldn't actually figure that out. Okay? So what this is, if you have m quality processes, okay, you need 3m plus 1 total processes of which 2m plus 1 perform uh, correctly and m are 40. Okay? So essentially that's going to give you uh, the ability to handle Byzantine calls. Okay? So this is also referred to as the Byzantine's general problem in the literature where uh, named after Roman Byzantine's uh, area where you actually had lots of traitors and you couldn't actually figure out who to trust, who to not trust. And the question was if you had this problem, how would you reach agreement? Okay. So the question that was actually just asked is uh, said here, say if you want to simply detect that uh, you don't, you have disagreement and there are some, some fault that is much easier okay there you just need 2k plus 1 okay even in this case okay which is 2k plus 1 you have three processes for k equals 1 you know there is disagreement there is some fault in the system so you can detect that there is fault okay but if you want to reach agreement and produce an answer even in the presence of fault 2k plus 1 is not enough you need 3k plus 1 in that case that's really the difference between that okay is the equivalent of saying i know one of you Two of my between two of my friends, one of them is lying because they dis the fact that they disagree tells me somebody is lying, but I don't know which one. Yes, question then. Uh, why jump from two K plus one to three K plus one? Is two K plus one the lower bound, or do you mean that's two K plus three? No, so three K plus one is actually not a lower bound. It is the value that you need as a proof that so you cannot do any better. That's, that's a proof that if you actually read the Byzantine general problem paper, there is a theorem that says if you have M Byzantine faulty processes to reach agreement, you need 3M plus 1. Okay, now having said that, uh, there has been a long line of research that has tried to, because this is such a high bar to implement Byzantine faulty system, systems that can trans, uh, handle Byzantine fault, there's been a long line of research that tries to uh, lower this overhead, I mean you can't actually lower it, but it tries to reduce the, the cost of deploying. So one thing that many people do is, uh, you basically have the computation stage and the voting stage. Okay? It's in the voting stage that you need to reach agreement. Okay? So in the computation stage, you just have 2k plus 1 processes. Okay? And then you have the 3k plus 1 voters who just agree. And the idea there is that the voters have to be much lower end machines than the computation which could be this actual servers. Okay, so, so the actual cost may be lower if you can use puny machines or just simple processes but, but you get away with 2k plus 1 actual servers because uh, it's the agreement part so you never want to produce bad results. Okay? So people have tried to say separate computation from agreement and said the voting you cannot do it, do away with the 3k plus 1. But computation I can reduce it because I can actually tell when the computation is disagrees. I never produce bad results. So things like that. Okay. Uh, so there is quite a bit of work on this uh, problem. But there is this fundamental bound and people have just tried to either find special cases where you can relax it. Okay, or try to think about how... Uh, there is this actual computation and then the, this is actually the voting part of the computation. Okay, this is what happens after you produce your output saying I have X soldiers is the computation you perform. After that you run this to figure out what the right answer is. Yeah, so it is, you can't actually do any better than that. That's actually a property of uh, Byzantine faults. Any questions here? Okay. Next time I'll talk a little bit about actual systems that use this. So as it turns out, there are very few real systems have adopted it. The couple that have adopted is one is Bitcoin. Okay, Bitcoin uses computation that actually performs uh, this computation on 3M plus 1 machines to tolerate Byzantine faults. And there's one a rare exception 
to the rule where most systems only say let's deal with visit, uh, crash fault tolerance, not visit default tolerance. And the other example where it's used in practice is things like airplanes, okay, where you don't want uh, to lose control because some fault occurred on one of the computers that was controlling some aspect of it. So some airplane systems actually use 3M plus 1 replication okay, as, as some spacecraft and so on. So some very mission critical things use it by and large. If you have a website, I don't think that most of them are going to go through this length to deal with faults. Okay? Any questions on this? Right. So I'm going to... Uh, so there are several other properties which I will not talk about. Can I, I have to keep in mind that uh, I also did not prove, prove a property here. So there is a paper by Leslie Lamport that was published in 1982, which gives this property. With M processes, you need 3M plus 1 to have. With M faulty processes, you need 3M plus 1 total processes uh, of a 2M plus 1 function correct. I did not prove it. I just proved it by example, yeah, which is really not a proof at all. Uh, so keep that in mind. But we didn't actually, uh, I just showed you an example, one where it works and one where it doesn't. And then there are several other scenarios or properties that I will not even go into any detail. One is it says if message delivery is unbounded, uh, meaning that messages can take arbitrary amounts of time. It's not that you lose messages. He said if you're unreliable channel, nothing can be done, even with two processes. Okay, let's say your channel is reliable, but it, the delivery time is unbounded. It can take an arbitrarily amount, amount of time to deliver message, which means you will not have a faulty network, but the network can be arbitrarily slow. Okay? If you have that property, again, the problem, you cannot solve this problem. Okay? Because you can, it can take an arbitrary amount of time for messages, the, for, for the network to deliver messages. So in some cases, messages may not reach at all and you will not be able to reach agreement. So there are many such properties that have been proved which we won't go into. And not directly relevant here. Okay. So that's all about Byzantine fault tolerance. I'm going to talk a little bit about again uh, thinking about the network aspects and how faults are handled in practice. Okay. We had looked at this uh, very briefly when we talked about RPCs and RMIs in chapter 3. If you remember I said uh, how can you deal with failures when you have RPC systems? Okay. What happens if the client, we actually looked at this 5K specifically. Okay, what happens if the client cannot locate the server? The request, the RPC request is lost. The server crashes after it starts processing the RPC request. The server processes the RPC request, but reply is lost and the client crashes. So if you remember, we had this notion of termination and extermination, all of these things we had talked about there. Okay, I'm not going to repeat that. I just wanted you to remind you that this is what uh, we had discussed and the, the real point here is we only dealt with crash fault tolerance. We only said requests are lost, not that the request is altered. You send the RPC for foo and you send some parameters, the network changes the parameters and sends it to the server. Okay, that we have not handled. Okay. Same with the reply. We did assume that the reply could be lost or the server crashes. But it's not that the server produces bad results that you can buy. So we never actually dealt with anything like Byzantine faults. By and large, we always assume that if you have faults, they are crash faults, meaning that you fail silently. Okay, nothing happens. Not that you get bad results. Okay, so that's the RPC case. Okay, and also briefly touched upon this whole notion of uh, multicast sending multicast messages and what happens if a multicast packet reaches some nodes but not other nodes. Okay, so in that context, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that again. Okay, so here the problem is the following. Okay, we have one sender, which is this machine here, and multiple recipients. Okay, in this case, we in this example, there are four recipients. Every packet is being multicast to four recipients. You send a packet once, it gets to four recipients. Okay, this is the problem of multicast. Now we will assume again that our network is not reliable in that the network can drop packets as we always assume. If you had unicast communication, you can rely on TCP to detect that the packet did not reach. 
there'll be timers, you'll retransmit and so on and so forth. You'll have acknowledgement going back and forth to indicate whether a packet was received. When you do multicast, you don't have the luxury of TCP. TCP only works between two pairs of processes and not with one sender and multiple recipients. So we have to basically decide how we are going to deal with uh, lost packets. And one thing you can do, the simple thing you can do is say, I will do whatever TCP does, which is every time the sender receives a packet from the, uh, the receiver, receives a packet from the sender, have them send acknowledgements, send an act. Okay. So what that will do is, uh, you send packet number 25, okay, in this case, let's say it reached all four processes, all four processes will generate an acknowledgement, the acknowledgement will go back to the sender, okay, this, so that's what is shown here. Okay, so you will basically, if you get four acts back from your four recipients, you know that the packet was received by them. Okay. Now, let's assume instead of four, there are 4,000 receivers. Okay, let's say you are doing a webcast of something. Okay, it's a live webcast and you have 4,000 receivers have tuned in. Okay. If you implement this scheme, okay, with 4,000 receivers, every time you send one packet, 4,000 acts are going to come back to you. Okay. And you have to make sure that all 4,000 have been received so that you know that the packet was received by everyone. Okay, so is there an issue with doing this simple ad based scheme okay the server is going to get loaded by simply doing ACK processing okay, instead of 4000 let's say 40000 which is not unheard of there are all these sports events where there are millions of people tuning in you send a packet and you get million acts back the server is going to just spend all of its time doing act processing, nothing else. It's not doing any useful work. Okay. So what this says is, while in unicast communication, an act is a good way to figure out whether the other end actually received a packet and if you don't get the act, you retransmit, you time out and retransmit. In a multicast scenario, acts are actually not the right approach. Okay. Because as the size of your multicast group grows, you are going to start getting flooded back. This is called an act flooding problem. Okay. So essentially the sender will become the bottleneck. Okay. So what do you do? How do you solve this problem? You still want to be able to figure out if somebody did not get your packet and retransmit. ACK is the wrong approach, what would you, what could you think of that? It's very simple, that will solve the problem. The problem clear, first of all, what the problem is. Okay, you have sent a packet, let's say some re receivers didn't receive it. How is the sender to figure out who didn't receive it and retransmit to it? So you ask the receiver to tell you if you didn't receive a packet. Okay, saying that if so long as you are receiving packet, don't send me any acts because I'm getting too many acts. But if you don't receive a packet, tell me and I'll retransmit you your packet. Okay. This is called a negative acknowledgement or a NAC. Okay, the answer is already here. Okay, so, so what a NAC based approach does is you send a packet, okay. Packet is received successfully, nothing comes back to the sender. Sender sends the next packet. Okay. Now, if you basically, if some sender receiver has missed a packet, it's going to send a NAC. How does the receiver know it missed a packet? Okay. So, the simple thing is if you have received packet number 24, okay, 25 didn't get to you and suddenly 26 shows up. Okay, then you know that you missed something. Okay, because you got 24, you got 26, but not 25. You send a NAC for 25 saying, by the way, I got the packet after the previous one, I haven't still received the previous one, resend it to me. This is called a negative acknowledgement. So this will work much better because the sender doesn't have to process n acknowledgements for n senders. It will only handle a small number of negative acknowledgement for those uh, end receivers rather. It will only get a small number of NACs for the receivers who are not receiving the data. 
it will only retransmit to those receivers. Okay, so in multicast, the NAC based approach is more efficient than an ACK based approach. That's really the takeaway. Okay, yes. Okay, so this is uh, that's a good point. You saw what is in the figure. So what is shown here is uh, an optimized approach where you, if you miss a packet, you can either send it back to the tree root of the tree, which is a sender, or you can ask your neighbors saying, "Do you have a copy of this packet?" So that's an optimization. The reason you have this optimization is although this is a very simple scenario, in reality, a multicast network may actually be a long tree. So each node in this tree, other than the root is the sender, each node is a receiver. Okay. So if some node in, deep in the tree has not received a packet, you could actually directly ask the sender. Or you can ask some of your peers in the tree saying, did you receive it? Okay. So what is actually shown here is you broadcast the NAC to all of your peers in the tree as well as your uh, parent in the tree, which in this case is a one deep tree, so that's the sender and anyone can send you that packet. Okay? That is just an optimization. You don't have to send it to others. You can just ask the sender if you want. But in, in case somebody else near to you has it, then they can send it to you directly. You don't have to bother the sender. Okay? So that is uh, how you can actually deal with retransmissions in multicast. Okay? You basically use NAC based approaches. Okay, I'm going to quickly talk about atomic multicast and then we'll talk about distributed commit. Okay. So then let me define what atomic multicast. First you need to know what multicast is. Multicast simply says that you are going to send a packet once and it's going to get multicast to a group of recipients. It's group communication. You send it once, so it gets to a bunch of uh, receivers. What atomic multicast says is that you want the system to give a guarantee that when you do a send, either everyone in the group receives it okay, or if some receiver fails or is not able to receive it, I don't want anyone to have received it at all. Okay. So I want atomicity property to be put on the multicast send request. It's all or nothing. Either everyone receives it successfully or if there's any error at all, do not deliver it to any of the members in the group. I don't want a scenario. What, that's what atomic multicast will tell you. Don't want a scenario where some members receive it and others don't receive it. This kind of property you may want, let's say, in a replicated database. Okay, you may send a query saying, add hundred dollars as a deposit to this account. Okay. Now, if you have atomic multicast, either all of the database replicas will receive it and process your query or no one will receive it. So you will not have an inconsistent state where some of them process this query but some replica never got the message so it never bothered to do it so now it's out of sync. Okay, then you have a problem. If your replicas go out of sync then bad things happen. Okay. So atomic multicast is useful abstraction to provide saying I, I, if this is a library that is going to say all or nothing. Okay, so it's a good property to have. I'm going to show you a very quick way to handle it. Okay, so this is again uh, example taken from the book where uh, there is a system that was developed at Cornell University called ISIS. Okay, it was a distributed middleware that implemented multicast. Okay, so you basically uh, rather than giving it to TCP IP, this middleware had some communication protocol where you could do a send and then anyone in the group, uh, anyone, all members of the group would receive it. But importantly, they provided atomicity guarantees on multicast message. They could guarantee you that all of the receivers would get it or no one. Okay? And that middleware was then uh, some commercial variants of this was adopted by banks that have this replicated databases to ensure that their databases stay consistent and so on. Okay? Now the way uh, ISIS implemented atomicity was through this notion of I need to track okay, when processes are going to come. So the assumption here is let's say we have something like this a TCP IP. Okay? Although we are doing multicast, we can implement that by sending n unicast messages at the middleware level. Okay? The process does, the sender does one send, it hands it to the middleware library. The library has a TCP IP connection to all the members and it can send 
the messages. So we'll assume that the network is not the problem here, but processes can crash in the middle. Okay. So here is a case where you do a send and some process goes away. So now if you want to actually uh, goes away in the middle of the send, so now you have a problem where some subset of the group has received it, the crash process did not receive the message. Okay. So you need to be able to track this property and then roll back saying whatever I've delivered, undeliver it. We don't actually give it to the application, just discard that message. Okay. So the way you actually implement atomic multicast analysis is you have this notion of a group view. Okay. Group view is essentially the set of processes that are currently in the group that are alive okay, and functioning correctly. And whenever you send a message, you want to ensure that everyone in the group, current group receives the message. If there's a group change in the group in the midst of a send, you basically just have to discard the message. Okay? And then what you do is you change the group. You tell everyone, say some process crashed, let's agree that the group has shrunk and let's all agree that's the new group. Okay? And once you agree on it, then you can resend and then you basically ensure that whoever is left in the group will receive. You never want a case where you say the group has 10 processes, I delivered a packet to only 9 of them because the 10th process crashed in the middle. That's not going to be allowed. Okay, so, so this is essentially what is being done here. So you want to agree on what is the size of the group or who are the members of the group. You have to agree on when the group changes, if there is a message being sent in the midst of a group uh, send, which is what is shown here, that here is the group. Initially it's P1, P2, P3, P4. P3 has crashed. Okay? So that message has to be essentially whatever message was being sent in the middle, you have to ensure that it's not going to be delivered. You have to discard it and ask the application to redo it. Okay? And once the group membership changes, okay, you have P1, P2, P4, that's your new group. Then you can continue to send the messages and it will be delivered to the new group. And it shows here that eventually P3 reappears as another group change and so on. Okay. That's how this middleware actually implemented the notion of atomicity. I won't go into uh, what is shown here. This is simply saying that you will track when processes crash, your 7 has crashed. You will essentially announce that 7 has crashed. Everyone will agree. And once the everyone agrees, then you are going to resend messages. That's all it's saying, exactly what I explained earlier. Okay. So what is uh, on this slide is actually showing, comparing atomic multicast and some variants of atomic multicast with normal multicast. Okay, there are many different variants of normal multicast. There's reliable multicast, there's FIFO multicast which ensures that messages are delivered in order. There's causal multicast which if you remember when I was talking about Lamport's clocks, we talked about causal delivery and using happened before relationship to deliver messages in order. Okay. So those are normal variants of multicast from a distributed application standpoint. You have atomic variants of all of this. You can have atomic multicast, which is like reliable multicast. You can have FIFO atomic multicast, which is going to basically to FIFO delivery, but guarantee atomicity on top. And you have causal atomic multicast, which is going to do causal delivery, but also give you atomicity. Okay, for all of those variants, you can add an atomicity property. Okay? And ISIS actually has this middleware library that actually implements all of them, okay? which is just as an aside. Uh, and it does take quite a bit of effort to figure out when crashes can happen and how to track them and how to ensure the uh, atomicity guarantees. Okay, so that is uh, multicast and atomicity. Any questions here before I move on to comment? This is a very quick digression into networking aspects of uh, failures. Okay, the by and large, the takeaway is Byzantine faults hard to deal with at a networking level. So you basically just assume crash faults, you can use acknowledgement based schemes for unicast communication, negative acknowledgement schemes for multicast communication. And if you want any better guarantees, you essentially layer atomicity properties on top of your communication. Okay. Okay, so we will now take this notion of atomicity and generalize it. Okay, a little bit. We are going, that will take us to this problem of distributed commit. Okay, this is an important problem also in distributed system and uh, also used widely in databases and so on. Okay, so first of all, I think we should realize that atomic multicast 
is a special case of a more general problem. Okay? And the more general problem is all processes in a group either perform an operation or not at all. Okay? In the case of atomic multicast, that operation was the delivery of a message. Either all processes in a group get a message or no one gets a message. But rather, but that whole idea can be generalized saying let us take any arbitrary operation. If you want to ensure that everyone performs the operation or no one performs the operation, you have the problem of a distributed commit. Okay, we had encountered this notion of a commit when we talked about database transactions. So if you remember when I was talking about asset properties, I said you, whenever a transaction finishes, it can do one of two things. It can either commit or it can abort. So once you are committed, you are done. Okay, that basically says the transaction is finished. Okay. Now we want to essentially do this among a distributed group of processes. Okay? In a database you may have only one process which is the database process that is simply trying to figure out should I successfully commit this transaction or not as a transaction. So again you get your all of the things property of the transaction. Here it could be any arbitrary operation. It doesn't matter. Okay? It could be multicast, it could be a distributed transaction okay, where the operation is to commit a transaction where the operation is to deliver a message. Okay? So the question is what protocol or what algorithm will you use for a group of processes to agree on whether to actually go ahead and successfully complete the operation or say the operation did not even take place, let's roll it back. Okay. So that's really the problem we want to address and we are going to look at now actually two approaches, I mean actually three but today we'll only look at one which is the problem of two-phase commit or 2PC, then we look at 3-phase commit 3PC, then this is going to generalize to this the problem of Paxos, which is the same generalization, is going to say, can we agree on whether to finish a transaction, finish an operation or not. 2-phase okay. commit is actually called 2PC in the database literature. Okay, it was proposed by Jim Gray, who was very, was rather, a very well-known figure in databases. It's a very old technique, proposed in 1978 almost 40 years old technique. We will talk about two-phase commit today and then I will show you some problems with it and then maybe next class we will get to 3PC, okay, three-phase commit and then hopefully that will lead to Paxos. Okay, so the idea here is going to be again we have to use voting to figure out whether the operation is going to finish successfully or not finish successfully. Okay, so the idea is as follows, we basically we want to figure out what to do with an operation. We will ask all replicas to first go ahead and figure out what to do with the operation. And okay? then they are going to vote saying should we all assume the operation finished successfully, yes or no. If everyone says yes, you are going to commit the operation. If you say no, you are going to roll back the operation. That is the basic idea. Okay? Whether it is delivering of a message or a, a, a transaction or any other operation. Okay? So the algorithm is general. Okay, and here you first we need a coordinator. Okay, so we'll have n processes, we'll elect a coordinator. Okay, we know how to do that okay, because we did leader election. Okay, you can statically appoint a coordinator, but let's assume you just elect one okay, using any leader election. Okay. And then once you do that, the actual technique is that very straightforward. Okay, convincing ourselves that it actually works is not that straightforward. Okay, the idea is very simple. But convincing yourself that no matter what happens, nothing can go wrong, that's where I think it gets to be tricky. So the idea is very simple as shown in the figure here. We are going to actually have two phases. Okay, the coordinator is going to ask everyone, what shall we all do? Okay, shall we say the operation succeeded or no, did not succeed? Vote. Okay, everyone is going to send back a vote saying yes or no. Okay, it worked or it didn't work. Okay, if everyone says yes, the coordinator basically sends out a broadcast saying everyone said yes. So let's go ahead and assume the operation finished. Okay. If anyone says no, even one process says no, the coordinator is going to send back a reply saying at least one process said no, so everyone roll back. Okay. So that's all there is to two-phase commit. Okay. It's basically a two phases, that's why it's called two phase commit. There's a voting phase where the processes are going to vote on whether they want to commit the operation and there's a decision phase which based on the votes, okay, you are going to either agree to commit or you are going to agree to abort. Okay. 
If everyone says yes, you are going to commit. If anyone says no, you are going to avoid. Okay. Here you have state transition diagrams that show you how the the fair the technique is actually implemented. Okay. So initially you are going to be in an init state. Everybody is in an init state where we have started voting. Okay. This is essentially what happens at the coordinator. Okay. So it's going to send out a request and say vote. Okay, so basically, if you are going to vote, and then it's going to go to wait state. Okay. Now, if any process decides to say abort, you are going to send out a vote abort. Okay, so and then we have to basically say that I got an abort vote, so I am going to send out a global abort. Say everybody roll back, at least one person said no, and then you go into the abort state. Okay, if everyone says commit, you are going to send out a global commit message to all other processes, and you go into commit. So this is essentially uh, what the core, this is the state transition diagram of a coordinator process. Okay, simply asking for votes and telling the results. Okay. This is the state transition diagram of an individual process. Okay. It's in the init state. Okay. And you get a vote, uh, vote request. If you vote abort, okay, you're directly going to transition to abort because you know you voted abort, that's going to force everyone to abort. There's nothing to do. So you will be saying, I voted abort, so I go into abort. Okay, on the other hand, if you actually want to commit, you have to go into ready state because you don't know what anyone else has voted for. You have to wait for the results of the election to be announced. Okay? So you go into ready state and wait for the coordinator to tell you what to do. The coordinator says, somebody else has said abort, even though you said commit, you are going to get a request to abort from the coordinator, you are going to go into the abort state. The coordinator tells you to commit, you are going to go into a commit state. Okay? Is that clear? So that is very simply two-phase commit. Now what you have to realize is uh, you, to convince ourselves that nothing can go wrong. Because this is all or nothing. Okay? This says that no matter what happens in the system in terms of processes crashing in the middle of all of this, bad things cannot happen. Okay, so we can start thinking about, uh, let's say, during the voting phase or during the decision phase, some process or the other is going to crash. Okay. And then can you actually have a scenario where some processes have committed and others have aborted? That would be a bad state to be. You cannot have that state. You always want everyone to be in abort or everyone to be in a committed state. So let's take an example. Let's take some examples. Okay, there are many different scenarios that can occur. Let's take the case where the coordinator asks for votes. Okay, everyone sends out a vote. Okay, okay, but you never hear from the coordinator what happened to the election. Okay, coordinator crashes after everyone's request has reached. Okay, what should the processes do? Okay, so processes had voted on something. Coordinator crashed after the votes were received, but never told anyone what the result of the election was. Okay, so all processes they are waiting for the result. What could you do in this case? Like two or three things you can do. You can decide I will abort without waiting for the coordinator, I will commit, or I will just wait. Not a whole lot more options. Should you abort because the coordinator crashed? Is that a safe thing to do? So the coordinator has crashed. Is it safe for Process is to say let's just avoid because coordinator is not telling us what to do. Yes. Elect new coordinator and You could elect a new coordinator and resend the request. Uh, that is possible. Uh, is that possible? So here, I think since you elected a coordinator, remember that that coordinator was also a process okay, that also voted in the election, but it was also a special process that was the coordinator. 
The problem is now that the coordinator has crashed. You don't know what that process has actually done. Okay, so the worst case scenario is you sent by, let's say everyone sent a vote to the coordinator, coordinator tallied its vote. It told it, it, itself what to do based on the, the results of the vote. But before it could send out a message telling everyone else what to do, it crashed. Have other processes say let's abort the transaction because we did not hear from the coordinator. That's actually an unsafe thing to do. That seems like the right thing to do, but it's not because what if the coordinator, which is also a process, says that everybody voted to commit, so the decision of the election was to commit. So it actually transitioned to a commit state as a process, but before it could tell anyone, it crashed. Now if the rest of them abort and the coordinator comes back up at a later time, you have a scenario where the co process that belongs, that's part of the coordinator has committed and everyone else decided to abort. Okay. So what might seem like a reasonable thing to do is actually not the right thing to do because you do not know what co the coordinator actually decided. And it may have told itself what to do based on that vote or without crash before it told anyone. So that's a problem. Okay, now obviously you cannot commit either. Okay, you cannot say, let's forget about the coordinator. Let's do what was said here. We'll elect a new coordinator. We will redo the vote. So out of n process, n processes, one has crashed. The remaining n minus one says, based on the new coordinator, we'll all agree to commit. Okay. That may not be a safe thing to do either. Because it may so happen that the coordinator process may have voted to abort the transaction. Okay. Now it has crashed, so it's no longer in the vote. Okay. The rest of them decide to commit and it had actually voted to abort. Again, you have a problem where the rest have committed and this process is aborted. Okay. So you cannot simply say, I will just ignore the failed process and the rest of us can make a decision. So what, is there anything you can do? What is the safest thing you can do here? Saying, uh, what will you replicate on the coordinator? No, no, I meant that this for this scenario, I'm not asking us to change the protocol. We will see how to change the protocol later. Okay, so I'm just saying coordinator crashed after you sent the election or the, the, you voted, but you didn't hear that. What can you do? Okay, so you can't abort because then there's a problem. You can't commit, there is a problem. So, what is the third option? Okay, you can wait, that's the only thing you can do. You can vote. The coordinator will recover at some point in time and uh, tell what tell us what the results are. Okay, so essentially that's what will happen with this protocol. Coordinator crashes before you elect before you get the election, you will sit in the ready state. Saying I am ready, tell me what to do. Okay, but I cannot move forward because the coordinator is not telling me what to do. We, the rest of the processes cannot unilaterally decide what to do by electing a new coordinator. So this process, this uh, protocol has the problem of uh, having the processes get stuck okay, if the coordinator crashes. Okay. Nothing bad happens. Okay. You will never have a stay a scenario where some processes have committed and others have aborted. Okay. Because you are going to just wait, you are not going to do anything. But nothing good is happening either. Okay. You cannot make progress in this case when the coordinator crashes. So, so you are basically have safety property is not violated. Safety property says nothing bad should happen. That's not going to be the case because the protocol is safe. Okay, but there is no liveness here. If the coordinator crashes, everyone is stuck. You can't ask the rest saying what shall we do and make a decision because there is the coordinator may have made a decision based on its own process and you cannot figure out what that is. So you have no liveness. Of course, if nobody has crashed or anything like that, the protocol will make the right decision. You will get the vote and you will all either abort or all commit and so on. Okay, so, 
So in the presence of a coordinator crash, you are going to be stuck, can't do anything. But if the if some arbitrary other process other than the coordinator crashes, I think things are still okay. okay because what will happen is, uh, well, not always. Uh, if if the if processes vote and then one process crashes, okay, the coordinator will receive its vote. It will basically decide what everyone is voted, and it will tell the rest what to do. Okay, and the rest of them can still pro proceed because that's an okay thing to do as far as the protocol is concerned. Okay. So in other words, if a non-coordinator process crashes after it has cast its vote, okay, you can make progress and actually enter a final state of abort or a commit. And that is a safe thing. The okay. question is why is it a safe thing? Why is it okay for a process to crash after it has cast a vote? So if you have received the results of, not the results, but whatever all the processes want to do, you have a decision. Okay. The only thing you cannot do is convey that decision to this one failed process, but you can convey it to everyone else. The worst thing that would happen is the process actually crashed, it entered the ready state and it's crashed. So when it wakes up, it's still in ready state. It can ask the coordinator, what did you decide? Although you didn't tell me then, tell me now and it can make the right decision. The other thing that the crash process could have done was it could have voted to abort, in which case already reached the final state. And it's fine for the coordinator not to tell it because if anyone votes abort, everyone else is going to abort as well. So in either of these two cases, regardless of whether the failed process voted to commit or voted to abort, if it voted to abort, it, you know that all processes can abort, this process has to go to abort. If it voted to commit, at most it would be in the ready state. If someone else also said commit or abort, you will be stuck here when you re recover. You can ask the coordinator and then make a decision. Okay. So basically it's fine for the remaining process to make progress in the case where the non-coordinator process crashes. Okay. The only problem that you have is if a non-coordinator process crashes when it's in the init state before it even cast a vote, then we have a problem. Okay, we don't know what it would do. In this case, it's still fine to abort because the worst case is that process is sitting in an init state. Okay, you could be, it could be told that everyone else aborted in this case. Okay. So when non-coordinator process crashes, you can still have liveness. If a coordinator process crashes, you have safety, but you are all stuck, can't do anything. So that's a problem with two-phase commit. It's a well-known protocol, why it's uh, very widely recognized, but it does have this issue of when there are crashes, nothing good can happen, although nothing bad happens either. So next time we will actually look at uh, generalization of this two-phase commit called 3PC or three-phase commit, where we'll try to get rid of this problem. Even if a coordinator crashes, first of all, we don't want anything bad to happen. That we have already achieved, but we want something good to happen as well. We want to be able to make progress even in the presence of crashes of any process. We will see how to do that. Okay. So we will stop here today. Let's continue next time.